So yeah, I'm going to talk today about playing with the indie web. Uh, I'll try and be quick about this anyway because I've got a lot to get through and we're running late. So in this talk, my aim is to you know, explain to you what the indie web is, give you a sense of the principles of it, and show you how to set up a minimal indie web presence, and then take a whirlwind tour through various protocols and specifications that have developed over time. Uh, I probably will zoom through this because there's a lot to cover and I'll be leaving bits out, but feel free to grab me later if you want to you know about anything else. So who am I? I've been making websites since 1994. Some of my websites are probably older than people here. Um, the one there is a, a weirdly embarrassing one for a band in the 1990s, and that's been running since 1994 and is still there through multiple server moves and that. And I publish, used to publish on my own site, but fell out of doing that when I, you know, Twitter came along, and it was just so nice and easy. Um, but I'm now trying to fall back into using my own site. So I work at Shopkeep. Uh, that picture, this site is mostly here, so I could use the picture. People who are not 30 or older probably don't understand that at all, but that's a joke. So what is the indie web? Uh, the indie web, according to its, you know, the website, is this rather, rather long thing, but the important bits are highlighted. The TLDR of it is uh, publish on your own site and own your data, basically. It doesn't mean you have to abandon other things. You can still use Facebook, you can still use Twitter. You know, it's not prescribed, you must give them up. Uh, it's just use your own site as your main thing and you can push to your other places, your silos if you want to. So key principles of the indie web, um, you should own your own data. So if you put, publish a photo, that's your photo. Instagram should know, own that. That shouldn't be the only place you have it. You should have it somewhere else. Um, make tools for yourself. So um, don't worry about hypothetical users. Build something for yourself. More people you know, can use it later if they find it useful and you can worry about expanding it, but you should build something for you to use and then use what you make on your own website. Ideally document things, so write about them uh, you know, and also open source. So write about things, release your code so that people can see it and learn from it. And you can also learn from them. Uh, with a view to having a plurality, which sounds grand, but it's basically many interoperable solutions. So there should be, you know, if there's a certain specification, there should be multiple different versions of bits of software using it so that people aren't focused on just one and using just one particular instance. Uh, the idea being that, well, first of all, it reduces lock-in to things, but it also means there are multiple versions, more people are trying things and specs tend to come out of that because people try things and go, oh, well, what, what about this? And other people implement it and you kind of work it out. Um, you know, one of the important ones is also have fun. It should be interesting to do. If it's not interesting to do, there's no point in doing it. I, you know, don't judge me, but I've had a lot of fun playing with this stuff for the last six months. So why might you go indie? There's a few different reasons, some positive, some negative. You might want to get away from silos. So, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name them, they could be argued as a silo. They basically require you to have an account for the site. They really prefer that you only talk to the people on the site as well. Um, you can generally post some content and they'll generally, you know, there's one of the things, they'll try and restrict what you can do with it. There's an access wall to you know, stop you being able to get things out. Um, or they'll claim ownership, generally, you know, the worldwide perpetual you know, royalty-free license that they'll have and, you know, if they can use your pictures for whatever they want, you know, and they didn't generally like to restrict your ability to take your content out, you know, or some bits of your content, they, you might be able to get some of it, but maybe your com comments you can't get or favorites, things like that are harder to get hold of. Um, so you maybe want to just reduce your reliance on silos. It's not like get away from them, it's just try not to be totally reliant on them so you have more control. There's also the problem of site deaths. Pretty much every site here is either dead or very much a lobotomized version of its former self. You know, GeoCities was the grand web site provider of its day. MySpace was, you know, Facebook of its time. Google Reader was a very nice, you know, RSS reader, but gone. And various other ones are still like, Delicious is still around, but is basically read only and now owned by another bookmarking site. And, you know, various other ones are gone. So what might you be able to do if you go indie? You can still do everything you could do before. 
It's not like you know you shouldn't you know be able to do stuff. You can you can also have certain things that you can identify yourself with your own site. So basically, go this is my website. I want to authenticate with it, and you can do that in the indie auth enabled sites. Lots of indie websites. You can publish your content. You can read other people's content. Comment favorite. All the things you can do on various different sites. And you know, as I said, keep using your silos. It's not like you you know it's not designed to send your data over. Uh, but it's just you're kind of encouraged to be in charge of your own data. So your first steps, you know, what would you do? Firstly, own your own domain, which is much easier nowadays than it used to be. I registered my domain in 2000, which again might be older than some people at this conference. Um, I had other domains before that, but they were expensive, and I had to share with multiple people because domains in the 1990s were not cheap. Whereas now. Every domain I own cost me less than the one domain I had way back then. Next, thing, set up a site. Simple website, nothing too complicated. That is literally what I put back up on mine. I'd let mine be dormant, so I just put that up. The content doesn't matter. Don't read the content. Um, but you know, that's what I put up. Uh, it's no, no masterpiece, but it's enough to get going. And you can you know, happily host a static site in GitHub or something. Stop reading it, people. That's the entirety of the HTML. Don't try and read that. That's too small. But that's the entire page. Um, the important part of that, though, is the microformats that are on it. So let's take a brief diversion there. Microformats are used for pretty much all the APIs in IndieWeb. They're just—it's a small amount of HTML. You just add some classes to say this is a like like a card or an entry or you know a citation and that type of thing, um, and some other little links as well. But so microformats, yeah, additions to HTML to easily markup, you know, blog posts, people, all sorts of things like that. IndieWeb uses it primarily for HCard to mark up who you are, which is what I do on my site. I'll show you on the next slide. HEntry, which marks up posts. And you just say, this is an entry. This is its title, other bits of information. But it allows it to be easily extracted for use later. And there's other things like you can mark things as in reply to with just setting a little class so that uh, when it's being parsed, it can easily tell, oh, this was a reply to this thing over here using a citation. And so that's the core bit. That's on the website. That's the main div. It's marked up with a class of hcard at the top. Uh, the paragraph's a note, and that's just a bit of blurb. And um, name is marked. And then on the links, there's some classes to indicate, oh, these are URLs that are related to my user. So that's it pretty much done. You know, that's all the excitement for the basic one, which that lets me use something called IndieAuth. IndieAuth is, you know, just a, allows me to authenticate with my site and other indie web enabled sites. The more complicated one is it's a federated login protocol. Yeah. No, basically, use your login, use your URL to log in on IndieAuth enabled sites. To do that, you go and enter your URL. This is an example site that you know, supports IndieAuth that can be used to test things. So, I did that. so you just stick your URL in. That site or application pulls your website down, looks for something called an authorization endpoint. And that's where you basically say, this site, its relation to me is it's my authorization endpoint. It'll deal with authorizing me and proving who I am. In this case, I'm using IndieAuth.com, which is a separate one because I didn't want to write my own to be able to start doing things. But I can change it if I want to and you know, replace it with whatever, just change my website. So you authenticate via your authorization endpoint, which basically just means the app or website you're trying to log into sends you there and goes, prove it. And the way IndieAuth.com does it is something called RealmeAuth. And that's just simply using those URLs that are on my site. They were marked up with rel equals me. And oh, that's just saying on my site. Over there, that's also me. Uh, so on GitHub, Twitter, and email, I'm just saying these things, they're me. And so I've got three there, GitHub, Twitter, email. In theory, I can hopefully use any of those. In practice, when I try to sign in, it's only giving me two. So I've got my email address. And I can say, use this, and it'll send me a code to my email. I don't use that. That seems really insecure. I just did it to demonstrate it. And GitHub, and that'll take me off to GitHub and go through its OAuth process uh, for me to prove, yeah, I'm really Steven, and that's really my website. Twitter isn't there because Twitter broke 
their RELME uh, set up about two weeks ago by updating one of their website, sorry, one of the profile pages to be JavaScript. And then it branches you over to the proper one, which has the RELME. Uh, so hopefully they'll fix it. They might not. But you can add others like Dribble, Instagram, various other people also support it. So you know, if you add us, you can have multiple places and decide, I want to use this to prove who I am. Uh, I, in this case, I chose GitHub, which takes me over to GitHub and goes, you want to sign up to GitHub to continue to use MDOF? You know, come and I go, I just do my usual GitHub login, you know, ask me for my two-factor off. This is all on GitHub. And then it go, bounces me back to the site going, yep, everything is good. And that lets me, you know, successfully authenticate using my site and say where I want to allow. I don't have to give anything to the site that I'm trying to log into. I prove who I am elsewhere, and it just tokens get passed back and forth and that type of thing to prove who's who. There's a lovely spec uh, that I haven't read. I just used the India thing. Uh, one day I will write my own endpoint for it. So there's a successful authentication, and that's great. You know, I can prove who I am and that type of thing. But that just I'm now logged into this and I can do nothing. So What's the point of that? Publishing. I want to be able to publish stuff. So I might want to publish you know, to my website. Generally, I will, because that's the whole point. Um, so if I'm publishing, what am I publishing? Posts. This is one of the core indie web things. We've got posts. And posts are, as you'd expect, anywhere else. It's just content, HTML. You mark it up with microformats as a H entry, you know, uh, which has little extra bits you can add. It's got a permalink on your site. You know, and it's on your domain. So that's great, but how do we do that? IndieWeb has developed a protocol called Micropub. And this is an open standard to W3C recommendation. Pardon me. And you can use it to create, update, delete, edit your posts on your domain using other third-party clients. So you basically provide an endpoint to say, I have Micropub, and then Whatever clients you want to use can go, oh, right, that's your micro endpoint. They authenticate using IndieAuth, as we saw, and then they can happily talk. You can also you know, have your own client hosted if you want to. There's lots of different options. So this is, it kind of supersedes the, was it XML RPC, sorry, Meta Weblog and Atom Pub. It tries to simplify them and make them a lot easier to manage. And generally, you're doing passing around JSON uh, when you're using it. So. So we're getting into a more complicated area. To use this, we can't just use some simple HTML and have everything. We need to have an endpoint on our site. Uh, but that's doable, and there's various ways of doing it. Firstly, this is how you tell your site, I've got a micro endpoint. It's just a link in your header. So saying the relation of this one, that's my micro endpoint. It's over there, and that's mine using uh, software you know, I've written. Uh, We'll have a brief diversion now into something to do with Micro, which is post types. If I'm posting entries, uh, they need, and I'm posting using H entry, there needs to be some way to tell what type of thing an entry is. And IndieWeb you know, has something like that, which is called post type discovery. It's another W3C thing. It's a working draft at this point. Uh, but the idea is you have uh, just a simple algorithm that says, given this data, I should be able to identify what the different types of posts are. So if it has an event field, it's an event. Like, it's as simple as that. And then it gets into things like if it's got an RSVP field and it's one of these values, it's an RSVP to an event. And uh, it gradually works its way down. And they're the standard default types that are in the, the list. You can extend it. What tends to happen is these are the ones that kind of the community has gathered around and standardized on. And there are certain ways. There are various other ones that are people are using in some places, but there's slight variations. So until they get standardized, they don't go into the, you know, this particular thing. But you can still make use of them. I've written a gem for my use, because I use it in multiple places. Uh, that just takes the JSON in and then uses that, goes, that's a video, or that's a note, or it's an article, or whatever. And this is how I use it. You know, it's just I've indie web post types gem. I pass the data in and say, what's the type? And it goes, note or whatever. Uh, that's using the default ones. I also can you know, configure it and just say, oh, actually, bookmark isn't a standard one, weirdly. I found that strange when I was doing it, but it's not been totally agreed. You know, it has, so it hasn't been put in the default type. So uh, I wanted to use bookmark. So I just go, oh, create a new class. And I just tell it, stick an identifier in so that can spot them. 
but put it before this one because it works through them in order and has note at the last one. And just if it doesn't know what anything is, it goes, it's a note. Uh, so I, just, I wanted to put it in a bit before. So I just said, yeah, before the article check, check if it's a bookmark. So it just does that. And then you just use it as normal. So that's fine. We've got things such as clients, which is, you know, sites you can go and use to write posts and that type of thing. I'm just going to go through a few of them to give you a quick idea of you know, how they work before getting into the gorier details. One of them is called Quill, which is the one I use mostly if I'm playing with stuff. And it's just, you know, you log into it using IndieOff, and then you get an interface for various different things. In this case, you're writing a short post, so like a note, that, you know, a Twitter type thing or something, and you can add slugs and tags and all that, you know, fun stuff. This is their interface for adding a, a favorite. Now, I never use this. There's other plugins you can use. There's extensions for Chrome and Firefox that let you automatically do it when you're on a site. You can go, oh, I want to mark this as a favorite, and it then talks to your MicroPub endpoint. But they have, you know, this Quill has different interfaces for all these different types. And then it also has this, which is kind of the, if you want to write fancier articles, it's just a medium type thing. You stick your title in, write lots of stuff. And then there's some settings you can set for like slugs and everything. All your data then just gets sent to your MicroPub endpoint, and it deals with it. There's also another one I've been testing, which is Indigenous. And Indigenous is a both iOS and Android app. They're actually developed by two different people, but they've settled on using the same name. Uh, it's currently in beta, and it's a share sheet just in your iOS. You, you know, and you can just, when you're on a website, go share sheet indigenous and then go, I want to like this. And it goes, OK, I'll talk to your microphone endpoint and do it once you've authenticated. And, and the one on the right here, the, it's realized the web page is talking about an event because of the uh, microformats on it. So it changes it to say you want to have RSVP options, basically adjust them depending on what the web page is, you know, because it can tell what's going on. So more complicated one, we've got the endpoints. Uh, having clients is great, but you know if they don't have anything to talk to, that's no use. So you need to have an endpoint. It, there's quite a lot of spec, and I spent an inordinate amount of time at Christmas reading it, and there were good reasons. Don't judge me. Um, but we'll take one last diversion into this because there's one little thing I didn't tell you earlier that you now need to know in order for this to make sense. So we've got one more thing about authentication. When Remember I said, you know, a site can ask for permission to use your site to authenticate and access your site. Um, it can also ask for scopes. Uh, so it basically goes, oh, right, um, I want to be able to use your site. Can I have these permissions? So in this case, Quill asks for create and update permissions, which makes sense because Quill is trying to use your MicroPub endpoint to add posts and edit posts and that type of thing. So it goes, can I have these? And if you complete the process, you're basically going, yes, that's good. And it does that, and then it, you know, so it also then takes, you know, you have one extra added complication. Earlier I said, when the authorization endpoint comes back, it goes, it gives you a token and says, yeah. What it actually does is it gives you a token, and then the site goes, all right, do you have this other endpoint, which is a token endpoint? And you do, because it's in your header, and, you know, you've been good. And it then goes to the token endpoint and says, I've got this other token from elsewhere. Can you exchange it for a token I can actually use to talk to the website? And that token is the one that the token endpoint knows about. And it's also aware of what scopes you've got and what site it's available for. So um, it's that I just use IndieAuth.com has a little tokens endpoint as well. I use both. You can implement them separately. I can have a token endpoint you know, implemented in PHP on this site and Ruby on some other site if I wanted to. Um, it's up to me to change them. I just change them in the header and everything just magically starts working. Uh, I've also, I wrote, I've written a gem for myself because I was doing this in multiple places and it just takes the access token when the MicroPub M, sorry, client sends it, it goes, I've got this token and then it goes and talks to the token endpoint goes, what about this? And then verifies it and it does things like making sure that the domain you're trying to access is the right domain, you know, I've not sent, you know, if I send my token to somebody else's endpoint, it should look at it and go, you're not the right URL, go away. And, or it can also verify scopes because certain t actions only require certain scopes or actually require scopes. So it checks all that. So that's all very good. We can get back to posts now on, from the endpoint point of view. Posts are actually straightforward enough in the end. That's a very minimal create. 
basically I post to my MicroPub endpoint and give it JSON. And on the basis of that, it can tell what it needs to do. Um, so I'm telling it it's a H entry and these are its properties. And you know, in this case, it's a photo. It's you know, just some weird JSON. Uh, weirdly, things have to always be arrays. There's a good reason, but I'm not going into that. This is an update, which just goes for the update. You say, my actions update. Here's the URL I want to update, and here's what I want to do with it. And you can, you know, there's replace, delete, update options on things. So you can, and you can call multiple ones at the same time. So you could you provide replace, add, and delete content simultaneously, and it'll do all the needful and update everything in the back end and go, yeah. So this is delete. I think that's fairly self explanatory. You know, I want to delete this URL, this post. And then undelete, which is, yeah, I made a terrible error. Uh, so they're, they're all fairly straightforward. And then there's one other, which is kind of for configuration options. So the client can get in touch and go, um, I've been given permission to this. Can you tell me how you're configured so I know what to do with things? So you can set things like a media endpoint, which you can use to upload uh, video, photos, audio to. Um, if you don't have that, then your endpoint deals with that directly. Uh, but the media endpoint you can do and have it as a little separate thing and it'll just go, you give it something, if everything's fine, it goes, okay, here's your URL for that back and then you use it as you want. Or syndicate to is your other option, which is basically saying this micro pub endpoint supports syndicating to these places. In this case, you know, it just says Twitter, but you could have whatever you want. It's up to the endpoint to worry about how that's going to happen. But you, you know, the idea is just on the front end, you'll have something which gives you an option saying, yeah, Twitter. Uh, so the client. So that's all very well, but you know, how how's it actually done? There's some software, you know, there's various, you know, once there's a MicroHub WordPress plugin which has been worked on a lot at the moment. Um, and that just adds a MicroHub endpoint to your WordPress site, so you don't need to do anything other than use away. Uh, there's Transformative, which is a Ruby one, which I'm writing my own and I've been heavily influenced by that. But you know, I wanted to do things a different way, so I've gone another way on it. And then there's various endpoints designed to work with static site generators as well. And then there are other ones uh, that are partially released, or like people haven't released the whole thing, but they've released bits of them and that type of thing. And then I have one I've been working on, which I'm calling Hotan. And if anyone knows what that's from, I'll be quite impressed. Um, so it's just a Sinatra application that supports you know, articles, notes, bookmarks, check-ins. And the only reason it supports check-ins, because I never use them, is because there's a site that will validate your endpoint. And you can, you know, you can authenticate with it, and then it'll fire test data at it. And some of the tests it did were for check-ins. And I went, I need, I need all the green ticks. So I did that. And then there's one other type I support as well. And for each of these, my endpoint you know, just uh, generates JSON for each one. So it takes the incoming data, puts it into a standard format, and tends to work out the post type and store that and that type of thing. And I'm playing with building it with Hugo, which is the Go static site generator, which is awesome. I've only been playing with that for the last couple of weeks. Um, it's not released at the moment, but it will be at some point. The one extra type I've been doing is playing with um, Scrobling. Scrobling, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Um, Last.fm made that weird name up. But I used to use Last.fm a long time ago and then stopped just, they were, you know, things they were doing were annoying me and I was just less enamored with the service to stop doing it. But recently I was thinking, I actually liked the fact that the data was there, but it's just, I didn't want them having the data. So I was thinking, I'd have to, and I went, well, I've got this MicroPub endpoint. And I'm, so I wrote a hacky Ruby script, which uses dodgy Apple scripts and you know, runs locally and just keeps an eye and go, what's playing? What's playing? Something playing? Oh, it's nearly finished. Oh, it's, yeah, it's close enough to the end. I'll count that. Uh, nabs the data and stores it. And then another script that runs and just goes, what ones have I not sent yet? Takes them, looks up some extra data on them, and then hits my MicroPub endpoint going, here it is. And to make that work, because you know, Scrubbles aren't a default type and there's no consensus on it, I just wrote my own identifier for it to go, if you get something that says, you know, that you get the JSON in for an entry and it says it's a Scrabble of, and then there's stuff, that's a put Scrabble entry. So it does that and it records it as that type of thing, and then I can build it how I want. And that's been working perfectly happily. Nothing's fallen over just yet. Uh, I'm running a bit behind, so I'm going to speed this up. So as I said, you can do syndication. There's two common ways of doing syndication. There's one, 
which is Posse, which is publishing your own site, syndicate elsewhere. That's really straightforward. You write it in yours, but you've told your endpoint to do it. So as I showed earlier, there's, this was the Quill interface. There's a syndicate option down there, which took the syndicate options from my configuration. So you can just choose that, and then it tells the endpoint, oh, we're syndicating to here, and then it deals with doing that type of stuff. The other option is uh, Pesos. I always say that wrong. Publish elsewhere and then syndicate to your own site. There's some places you can't do Posse easily. Instagram is the kind of current main example. You can publish uh, pictures to Instagram, but they have a private API for that. So, and they're kind of a bit antsy about using it. So you generally have to use Instagram, post them, and then pull them down onto your own site, um, which is, yeah, it's not the end of the world, but you know, it's just one way of having to deal with this stuff. Well, that's fine, but what about when your site becomes really, you know, you become really popular and people are commenting and liking and that type of thing, but they're liking your Twitter post or your Facebook post and that type of thing. How does that help? Well, we have things called web mentions. It's another endpoint on your site because everything is a web point. An endpoint, sorry. And this is another W3C uh, recommendation. Again, you just have a rel tag on your header saying, this is where my web mentions go. In this case, I'm using someone else, which is webmention.io, which is a service that deals with it. And it does the hard job of listening for web mentions. So if a site, you know, if some other indie, auth, sorry, indie website writes something or does something, in this case, they'll ping my web endpoint, which will go to there. And it's basically a listening service. It goes, all right, I'll record that for you. And when you want it, you just ask me by the API and you do that. Um, that's all very well and good, but that only is going to work on other indie websites. And you know, there, there are more than there were, but it's not great. Like silos aren't going to do it. Twitter's not going to tell you. Facebook isn't going to tell you that type of thing. So there's another si system called Bridgy, And that's a service that you authenticate with it and say, I have Twitter. Um, you can talk to my Twitter. That's good. And it then keeps an eye on those sites for you. If somebody favorites or likes or responds, it goes, oh, right, I've got that. I'll get that, I'll put it into a nice common format, and I'll send it to your web mention endpoint. And so it just keeps those going. So you can get notifications from all the silos that don't actually support web mention. Uh, well, all the silos, a number of silos. It's gradually expanding. There's, this is the ones that are covered at the moment. Facebook, as you know, is struck through, because Facebook broke that on Thursday. <laughs> they've, they've gradually been breaking bits, and oh no, you can't have your comments through the API, no. And then we're taking other bits away. Thankfully, I don't use Facebook, so it doesn't affect me. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but they, they keep breaking bits, so it's getting harder to do. So the supporter of Bridgie officially went, I'm not supporting Facebook right now. I'll look at it again when they you know, sort it out. So that's the MicroPub endpoint. I've got two minutes, so I'm going to go really quickly on my last 13 slides. <laughs> there's, there's also reading. So you know, you're publishing, but you want to read other people's stuff. So there's I think you know, Google Reader's dead, and there are you know, still readers out there, but maybe you want to do your own. There's a thing called Microsub, which is a protocol, and it's very much in progress. It's only been going since early this year, and it's kind of in flux, and things are changing quite a lot. But it provides a standard way for clients to get content from a server and interact with feeds. Um, so the server's responsible for talking to the, you know, all the feed sources you're interested in and getting those and standardizing them, and that type of thing, and dealing with getting updates. The client is just going, I'll talk to the server and show you stuff. Um, so authentication, it's in the auth, exactly the same as it was earlier. So the client, there's a few of them. I'll just give you, this is one of them. This is Monocle, which is the one I mostly use. Um, you've got channels down the left, and you can add sources to that. And you've got posts on the right there. This is another one called Together, which is a JavaScript React app. Again, channels, posts, all the same type of thing. And then this is Indigenous, again, which was a micropub one I mentioned earlier, but it also does microsub. Um, so you can subscribe. The great thing about it is, because of the way your server is the one holding the data, you can, and I do, you can use my, uh, like Monocle on your desktop, but Indigenous on your phone. And it'll happily, everything's kept in sync, because all they're doing is telling the server, I've read this, and that type of stuff, and everything keeps going. So, so as I said, there's channels. As many channels you add, add things, read indicators. And you can, in theory, block and mute people, but nobody supported that yet. Um, and posts, again, all the usual things, multiple types, and you can add actions. So if you favorite it and you've 
configured it properly, you, it'll use your microprobe endpoint. So your microprobe endpoint will talk to your microprobe endpoint and say, I favorited this, and then it'll go to your site. So it's all interactive. And then there's various servers. There's two going at the moment, Aperture and Excert, Exter, which is in Go. And then I'm writing one as well, which I'm calling Use Dragon, mostly because I'm just having fun. Again, if anyone knows where that's from, I'll be impressed. Um, it supports most things. It's mostly working, but it's just kind of, it's rudimentary for like, I've got scripts I run to add server, sorry, subscriptions and that type of thing. I need to tidy all that, but it, it works. I just run it locally on my laptop at the moment, use ngrok to tunnel it, and then I ha Monocle will happily talk to it and I use away at it. So, you know, if you'd like to know any more, there's a number of sites, you know, that are kind of, into, and there's a few websites, which I found really useful when I was first getting up to speed and just listen to like a lot of microcasts, like they're three minute episodes and that type of thing. And there's so many blogs, uh, so many I didn't bother listing them. I will update that at some point to say. And that's a very quick run through of all things IndieWeb. So thank you.